Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I didn't get a chance to meet with everybody in the beginning, but I want to say that I'm happy to be here again, a chance to visit with all of you. Lately, I have been beginning a study of Jesus' parables. And as you all know, there are some of them that are very easy to understand, and there are some that are a little bit more difficult. We're going to be looking at one of those today. But first, I'd like to start out with a, a short prayer. Dear Lord, we welcome you into this, your house of worship. And as you have told us, when two or more are gathered in your name, that you will be here. Be where, here with us, Lord, and let your words lead us to your grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How many have heard the phrase, life isn't fair? <laughs> Our mamas told us that a long time ago, and they keep telling us, don't they? Life just isn't fair. Well, believe it or not, one of Jesus' parables at face value certainly sounds like it's not fair. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew 20. It's a little difficult when I have to hold the mic, but I'll manage. The parable we're going to be looking at is the parable of the workers in the vineyard. And you'll see the first words, for the kingdom of heaven is light. Well, Jesus used that phrase quite a bit because he's using this parable as a symbol or as what some people would call a synonym for what's in heaven. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, in some translations they call it a penny, he sent them into his vineyard. Well, we don't see a lot of day laborers like that anymore, but back in this time period, that was a common occurrence. Landowners would go to the marketplace and they would hire individuals to do whatever was needing to be done in the fields, and this was especially true during harvest. And a denarius, or a penny, was a day's wage at that time. And these people would work from 6 o'clock in the morning to 6 o'clock at night for something that's a little more than a penny. Well, a denarius was a Roman coin that weighed approximately 0.125 troy ounces of silver. But believe it or not, that would buy quite a bit back then. In verse 3 he says, And we went out about the third hour and saw enough others standing idle in the marketplace, and said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Again he went out about the sixth, the ninth, and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and find others standing idle, and said to them, Why are you here standing all day? And they said, Because no one hired us. And he told them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, you will receive. So when the evening came, and the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those came who were fired about, hired about the eleventh hour, they received a denarius. But when the first came, supposing that they would receive more, they likewise received a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one man and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first 
and the first last, for many are called, but few are chosen. At face value, this kind of sounds like an unfair arrangement, doesn't it? I mean, here these guys have been working since 6 o'clock in the morning and 6 o'clock at night. And all they got for their effort was a denarius when someone who came in at almost the end of the day got the same amount. But, we would consider this to be a, a labor scenario that isn't exactly fair, is it? So obviously the protesting laborers make their case. The last worked only one hour. And you've made us equal to us who have borne the burden of the day. It's not a matter of the first labor slacking off, or the ones that came later were better educated, or even had greater need. The owner's reply is simple to understand, though. I can do what I want. It's my things, it's my money. If I want to give them extra, I'm going to give it to them. At this point, we could almost believe that God runs his kingdom on a basis of inequity. That he simply does what he chooses without a basis for fair play, if we're using this as a comparison. But the context of the parable is what's going to help us understand what Jesus is really getting at here. And the real story has actually taken place before we have this parable. And you probably remember it because it's a very popular story in Matthew. We're going to look at Matthew 19 <coughs> right now. And we're going to look at the rich young ruler which occurred right after Jesus had received some children. And this individual had seen that and was very impressed with Jesus. So he followed him and ran up to him and said, Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? For no one is good but one. That is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, which ones? And Jesus says, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things... I have kept from my youth. What more do I lack? And Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. was impressed with this young man for a number of reasons. And you can see a lot of them if you look in Desire of Ages, starting at page 518. And to summarize, Jesus was surprised at his attitude. The Pharisees, whenever they came in contact with Jesus, they attacked him, didn't they? They were always questioning what he was doing, especially when he was healing on the Sabbath. Heaven forbid, healing on the Sabbath. Right? But he himself had said it is all right to do good on the Sabbath. But this young man was different. He was rich, young, ruler, probably a Pharisee himself. But he was asking questions. He was thinking that there was something missing that he hadn't quite got a handle on it. So he's asking Jesus, what must I do? And Jesus basically tells him, follow the commandments, but he adds that one extra item. Sell all you have, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. There's a reason he told him this. 
Jesus sensed that he had idols in his heart. Three specific ones. He had the idol of his possessions. He had the idol of his influence. And he had the idol of his power. The only way he could become a disciple of Jesus, which is what Jesus wanted, was he had to let go of those idols. The hardest was going to be letting go of his possessions. Because that is an idol that we all fight with every single day. Ellen G. White wrote a section here that I'd like to quote for you. Love of self limits us. The lover of self is a transgressor of the law. The rich young ruler professed to have kept the commandments, but he was destitute in the principle, which is the very spirit of life, fall. He did not possess true love for God or man. This want was the want of everything that would quantify him to enter the kingdom of heaven. And his love of self and worldly gain was out of harmony with the principles of heaven. He wanted eternal life but would not receive into the soul that unselfish love which alone is life. He was in love with himself, but not in love with his neighbor. And was that not one of the commandments that Jesus told him he needed to abide by? And he had missed the point. And he turned away and saw it. Now, when Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you, that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And when his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? You've got to remember that at that time, the Pharisees and the scribes had convinced the people that they earned salvation through the law. We're not talking about the law of God here. We're talking about the law of man. You can't earn salvation, but they believed you could. And even the disciples have yet to realize that error. Because they see this rich young man who's fairly moral. I mean, he hasn't done anything wrong. He's just rich. But remember, Job was also very wealthy. And when Satan came to God and God said, See my servant Job. And what did Satan tell him? Well, of course he's your servant. He's going to praise you. He's rich. You've got a wall around him. He's all protected. But you take that away from him and see what happens. What did God tell Satan? Go ahead. You just can't hurt him. You can't touch him. So Satan takes away his children, takes away his livestock, takes away his land. And what happened? Job still praised God. When Satan returned, God said, see, I told you so. Satan said, now wait a minute. All we did was take away all of his stuff. You attack him and see what happens. What did God tell him? Okay. You can do what you want, but you can't kill him. So he ended up with a lot of affliction, didn't he? But he still praised God. Then here come his friend, right? Boy, you must have done something awful bad. Look what God's doing to you. But we know it wasn't God doing it. But he still kept his faith. And what happened? God gave him back what he had and more. Right? But this young gentleman hasn't learned that lesson yet. And evidently, neither have the disciples. 
Now when you read the part about the eye of the needle, I know the first thing I thought of was the eye of a sewing needle. You know, that's a pretty small hole, right? And for a human to go through something like that is going to be a miracle, much less a camel. But they're not actually referring to a sewing needle. See, in those days when they had the cities, they had these huge doors, the gates, that they could shut at night, you know, keep vermin out, or other people, whatever the case may be, or if the city was in danger. But in one side or the other of those doors was a very small door. And they used to refer to that as the eye of the needle. Reason being is, when you shut that door, that was the only way in or out. But usually it was a foot above the ground, and it was only about four foot tall. Which means when they opened the door for you to go out or come in, you had to step over and duck. Otherwise you had a very large headache. Or you tripped. But the point was, only one individual could move through that door at a time, and especially if it's an enemy trying to get in, that location can be easily defended by one person. That's the eye of the needle they're referring to. But a camel's not going to go through that one either. When we look at verse 26, Jesus looked at them and said, With men this is impossible, with all things God, or with God all things are possible. Then Peter answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? So Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of His glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, sisters, father, mother, wife, children, lands for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Where we just heard that? In the parable of the vineyard. The disciples were very proud of themselves. Okay, they had been with Jesus because he selected them. But think about this too. He told that rich young ruler, you've got to sell all your possessions. Give it to the poor. He never told Simon he had to sell his boat and his nets, did he? No. But does that mean that those who have less find it easier to follow Jesus? No. But it does mean that they have fewer idols to deal with. So what does it mean when the last is first and the first is last? Well, the answer, you know, will unlock some of that meaning for us. As I said, the disciples were astonished that he would make such a statement. And they felt pretty good about the fact that, well, you know, we've been with Jesus all this time. Who was with the landowner the whole time? The first group that he had made an agreement with for a specific amount. But he never made that agreement with anybody else, did he? Remember when he went out later, he just told them, I will pay you what I think you've earned. Right? So what we're seeing is, we're getting closer to the point here. Was he saved? Were they saved because they gave up everything? No, not necessarily. Would the rich ruler have been saved if he'd given up everything? Not necessarily. But he had to make the commitment. He had to prove himself. He had to understand that serving Jesus is not a right. Serving Jesus is a privilege. It's not something that is going to give you a wage, per se, because he is not dealing with money. 
And too many people, when they read this parable, they're thinking more on the side of the money. We'll see the specific on that here in just a second. Like I said, the disciples were pretty proud of themselves. Right? Because they had been with Him all this time. And even Peter, you know, had said, what are we going to receive? And Jesus told them. But how do you think they felt the night Jesus was betrayed? Do you think they were real happy with themselves at that point? What about Peter? He denied Jesus three times the night he was betrayed. Do you think he still felt so great about himself? I don't think so. When these workers were receiving the denarius, the ones that were, especially the ones that left out, think about it. They hadn't expected that. So they were real happy with this guy. This is a real nice man. He is really helping us out. It's the same with everyone who came you know, at the different times. The ones that were arguing were the ones that had agreed on a specific amount. Do you think they, they would have had any argument if he had paid the others less? Probably not. But when they saw the guy coming in at the 11th hour getting a denarius, they were probably sitting there, well, we've been here 12 hours, he gave him a denarius for one hour, we should get 12! That's not what's going to happen. Everyone's work is not the same. And even if it was, even though those first laborers, you know, worked the longest, your batteries died Switch over to this one. Try this one. Batteries died on the other. Okay. I don't think it's working. Okay. There we go. Sorry about that. This is going to slow me down a little bit, but not much. Okay. Where was I? Okay. Remember the question of the disciples. Who can then be saved? Here was Jesus' answer. With man this is impossible. With God all things are possible. What he's saying is work as hard as you can. You can receive no pay unless it's given to you. Look at the first guys that went in there for the denarius. They can't pay themselves. They have to depend on a landowner to, be, get, to get the pay for what they did, right? They can't profit themselves. There's a crucial difference between God and the landowner. The landowner needed laborers. He had to have them in there to work in his vineyard. But does God really need any laborers? No. No. God doesn't need to. God chooses to give as He pleases. And whenever He gives it, He gives it out of generosity. Not because He owes it to anyone. Those who think they are first in line to receive salvation because they've worked the longest and the hardest for such a reward are going to find out they may very well be last. Or they may not be there at all. Whether they are like that rich wrong ruler who regarded himself as a worker from a young age, or even like the disciples who prided themselves on making greater sacrifices. Meanwhile, there are others, and that should, or probably most of us, are aware that we don't deserve much, really. But they may very well find themselves being called ahead to receive the reward of eternal salvation. Why? Because salvation belongs to God, and God gives it out of His generosity, not out of death. Anyone who thinks God owes them salvation is going to learn the hard way that God is not a debtor to anyone, is he? That's a lesson a lot of us need to learn. Are we like that rich, rich young ruler 
you've done pretty good in life, worked hard, been honest, you know, had the positions that we have, and we acknowledge God has played the role in our success, are you willing to attribute success to His blessing? But is it a blessing that comes from you doing your part of working hard, being an honest person, contributing to the church as well as to other good causes? So you think God is blessing you for the good life you're leading? Therefore, you can be reasonably assured that when the time comes, He's going to receive you in heaven. To put it in the terms of a young ruler, yes. Maybe you have. And as they, the Pharisees would say, you've done it the hard way. You earned it. The question is, have you? Scripture declares that no one is righteous and that we are all under sin. Romans 9.23. Romans 3.9.23. Have your works brought you new status? Scripture says that we are all dead to our trespasses and sin. Ephesians 2.1. Have your works raised you from death? Here's an illustration that we can kind of have help us understand that. I doubt if anybody here was alive at 29. Raise your hand. Fine. Bob, you alive at 29? No, I'm not. Just as a demonstration. But we all have heard of the Great Depression. In 1929, hundreds, maybe even thousands of people lost millions of dollars in the blink of an eye. This one particular individual who had lost a small fortune came home dejected, upset, and as you probably have read in the history books, a lot of them committed suicide. Went to the top of the building and just right on. He came home and his six-year-old son realized his father was Dejected, upset. Didn't really have an idea why, but sensed that there was something to do with the finances of the family. So he says, Daddy, don't worry. I'll give you all the money in my piggy bank. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's, you know, for a six year old, that's quite a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, what's in that piggy bank is not enough to really help much with the debt the father's accumulated. But think of what our sin has done to us as far as debt is concerned. Until we own up to the fact that we do have a dilemma, that we are sinners, and that sin is a debt that we have to repay, Nothing is going to make us acceptable in the eyes of our Lord. We think we can be earning the wages of eternal life when in reality our sins are earning a lot more in the wages of death than we see. It's merely not just a large debt, but a debt that keeps growing. It's only when we enter into the point, or reach that point where we understand exactly where we stand and go to God through Jesus and find the mercy that is waiting for us. Mercy through our Lord Jesus who had done all the necessary work for our salvation. When we take that gift that Jesus is going to give us It's hard to accept because it's so simple. We live a life that's so complex. When something comes along that's easy, that's simple, we don't want to accept it because it's, you know, you've all heard, you know, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. This isn't one of those situations. This is true. Jesus paid our debt with his blood and his life on that cross. He died for us. He took all of our sin on himself. He didn't have to. He 
he had the option. He was the Son of God. And there were times when you could see the God person inside that body show through. But he held it in tight control. Because he knew that the only way we were going to be saved is if he gave his life for us. It goes against the grain to have something so simple be available to us. There are some who may identify more with the disciples as Seventh-day Adventists. Sometimes we think that especially if you've been in a Seventh-day Adventist household from the beginning, you've been a servant of God from the beginning, but that doesn't matter much when you think about it. Because if we came in at the 11th hour, just like on that vineyard, we have the same grace available to us. When someone accepts Christ on their deathbed, you could say that's the 11th hour. Don't begrudge them that moment. But at the same time, we should feel sorry in some respects that they didn't have the chance to know Jesus be able to serve Jesus, have that privilege yes. through their entire life. Mm -hmm. But just because they came in the 11th hour doesn't mean that they don't receive the same level of grace mm -hmm. that anybody else has. Yes. I wasn't born a Seventh-day Adventist. I was baptized into the Titusville Seventh-day Adventist Church in 2012. My wife and I were both baptized in that church in 2012. She had been baptized before in a Seventh-day Adventist church in Orlando years before. She was the one that brought me to the church. This is what keeps me in the church. This is the gospel. This is the word. This is our tie. The tie that binds. Yes, sir. As long as we abide by what's in the Bible, mm -hmm. it's getting back to basics. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, there's a lot of different churches out there who are forgetting the basics. And that's where we need to go. We need to stay with the basics. Amen. I'm sure you all agree that God actually has a sense of humor. Okay? And sometimes it's amazing who He will give His grace to. For instance, someone who has been a, a very vocal atheist finally sees the light. That hardened criminal in prison who suddenly sees the light. Maybe a wild rebel youth in his teens has caused his parents a great deal of difficulty who suddenly sees the light. And that light is the light from Jesus. God doesn't owe us anything. In fact, if you want to get right down to basics, He doesn't need us. He never did. But He wants us. We need Him. Amen. But He wants us. We are His children. And He wants to be with us. And He wants us to be with Him. He does not want to lose anybody.
The disciples learned the hard way that they couldn't compare themselves with anyone else. They couldn't really compare themselves with that rich young gentleman. They certainly couldn't compare themselves with the Gentiles. God's going to give salvation to whoever He wants. And here's what I think. Jesus' true followers learn about serving His kingdom. The service itself is a privilege. The first workers in the vineyard, if they had understood rightly who the Master was, would have thanked Him for giving them the privilege of serving that whole day. Really, those who missed out were the workers who weren't productive the whole day. So we never want to begrudge the sinner who comes to faith in Christ. Just feel sorry that he didn't know his Savior from his youth. All we need to know is to believe Jesus. Believe in what Jesus said. Believe in what Jesus did. And believe in the fact that He died for us. His blood, His sacrifice, and His resurrection were for us. And very shortly, when He comes again, we have the opportunity to prove ourselves. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for being with us. Jesus, we thank you for being our brother, our savior, our advocate, our confidant in heaven, and above all, our friend. Let us be worthy of you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.